uh, main room here at the fourth annual Sister District Summit. Um, I would like to introduce our head of campaigns, Kira Hall. Kira is going to lead the um, panel on campaign manager insights from a few of our campaign managers um, from 2020. So Kira, take it away. Thank you, Liz. It's so great to be here with everybody. I just enjoyed the breakout session we were in with Neil. He had some really great insights to share. Um, and I, I can assure you that the program we have left for the next few hours that we have together is just as rich and we are all going to learn so much. Um, so it looks like we have a critical mass here. So I will go ahead and kick off our presentation. Um, we are gathered here together to talk to some of our 2020 campaign managers for a campaign manager insights panel. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or who we have not had the pleasure to meet in person or virtually yet, my name is Kira Hall. I'm the head of campaigns here at Sister District. And I joined Sister District one year ago, almost um, in February of 2020, as the head of campaigns. Uh, prior to that, I had uh, gained about 10 years of experience working for Democratic candidates as a fundraiser and eventually a campaign manager. Uh, most recently, I managed John Bell's 2019 State Senate victory in Virginia, where I experienced the meaningful difference of Sister District support firsthand. As the, as the head of campaigns here, um, I manage our field and fundraising programs as well as the candidate services program. The candidate services program is designed to deliver tailored one-on-one -on -one support to candidates, campaign managers, and their teams in the areas of fundraising, field, communication, budgeting, management, and all that good stuff that we don't necessarily see um, campaigns dealing with day-to-day. Uh, -day. We try to provide the tools and insights to help them navigate those challenges um, productively. This year, I was delighted to get to know many campaign staff on a personal level through this program. While they may or may not always have a public facing role in the campaign, campaign managers are at the center of every campaign operation from managing staff and volunteers, managing their candidate schedule and keeping them on task, speaking with the press, leading a team of consultants and partners, all while making important decisions on behalf of the campaign that may, or that may end up being the difference between a win and a loss. Today, we are joined by some of the brightest minds who led our sister district endorsed campaigns in 2020. And I know that we will all learn a lot from them and I cannot wait to hear what they have to say. So just a couple notes on how we are going to run through our panel today. Uh, I will give each panelist a couple minutes to introduce themselves and learn more about their 2020 campaigns. Then I will be asking them some questions that I have prepared um, about the different elements of campaigning and things that I'm curious to learn and hear about from their perspectives. Um, and then we will have some time for Q&A. So as we go along, feel free to drop questions that you might have into the chat. I can't guarantee we'll get to all of them, um, but I will try to uh, work as we're going and pick out some of the great ones that I think uh, we should try to squeeze into the end. So uh, first I'm going to have all of our panelists introduce themselves. I think I see them all here. Uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order. So that would be uh, Alex first, then Brooke, then Gowrie. Uh, so Alex, I will kick it over to you for uh, a quick interview. Introduction. Yeah, so first off, thanks everyone for taking the time out of your day today for hearing for Sister District over the weekend. As uh, Sister District was a huge help on our campaign. As uh, thank you, Kira, thank you, Oscar too, thank you everybody that came out and helped. Uh, our campaign worked with South Bay and Sacramento Sister District. And we featured a Republican and incumbent running against, and we were the only red to blue flip in the PA State House. Um, and the margin uh, that we won by, even if you took the independence votes, added it onto the Republican, uh, she still would have made it. Uh, so our campaign, we had weekly meetings with everybody, including Sister Districts, Oscar II, everyone with support. I'm looking forward to talking with you guys about the importance of volunteering and time management and self-care and look forward to it. Should I jump in now? Yes, please do. Uh, first, I really want to give a huge shout out to Kira. Um, Kira was really such a huge conduit for our campaign. And I know for so many others, she is so reliable. Uh, and the rest of the sister district staff and all of the volunteers. We did also work primarily with two um, sister district chapters, but I know that there were tons that were connected with us. 
Um, and then of course our uh, postcard program ended up going a lot wider than just those two chapters. So I wanna thank every single person who's involved with Sister District. Um, you guys were the most impactful organization we work with to date. Uh, my name is Brooke. Uh, I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, for the past four years, I have co-run um, with my partner, uh, Georgia's sole progressive design firm, uh, designed by Miko, uh, and we're really focused on changing the politics in the South. Um, we, it's here that I actually pioneered a marketing and pay structure that kind of maintain business sustainability while breaking a barrier that so many candidates face to uh, having access to good design and communications, and that's fundraising, um, which is a really important part of every single campaign's vitality. Um, I've also worked with um, candidates from local municipal races all the way to federal races on uh, brand development and communication and messaging. Um, and one of my biggest passions is actually educating first time candidates on team building for success. Um, I worked with Shay Roberts uh, for state legislature here in Georgia, both on her 2018 and 2020 campaigns. Uh, and we are proud to say that in 2020, we finally flipped Atlanta's last held Republican state house seat, very much with the help of Sister District. Um, and I'm currently uh, back in school, actually, in an accelerated program for nursing. Um, and I'm working on a research uh, program right now to improve uh, overall health and uh, stroke perception in high risk populations. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. That is so impressive that you're in school for nursing right now. I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, that can be a whole different panel. <laughs> All right, now if we have Gowry on the line. Hey y'all, thank you so much for being here. Um, I mean, I just wanna echo what Brooke and Alex have said about um, just the help and the support of Sister District. I don't know that I would have made it <laughs> across the finish line without the support of Kira and Array. So, Thank you all so much for the support that you gave and also the support of our volunteers who were just amazing people, um, passionate people who just cared, you know, it's like y'all care just so deeply. Um, so yeah, my name is Gowry, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and um, I'm actually currently living back in Virginia. I'm helping out with the 2021 election cycle here, helping to retain our house majority because that's just gonna be super important. Hey, Liz. <laughs> um, so I was the campaign manager for Brittany Rodas, who was running as South Central Pennsylvania um, in 2020. Um, she is an incredible candidate and a dear friend to this day. And I'm so grateful that I had the chance to work for her. Um, you know, I'm really passionate about the, you know, the intersections of racial justice and um, faith community engagement and also electoral politics. And um, I actually came from an issue organizing background. And then I realized, you know, I'm so tired of organizing to avert total disaster. Um, so that just meant, you know, we need to win elections so that we can at least like organize for progress and not for like averting like mass deportations and other, you know, disastrous racist policies that were um, being enacted by not just the Trump administration, but also by state legislatures around the country, um, Republican run state legislatures around the country, if I'm gonna be more specific. Um, I also just a firm believer is that people live and die by state legislatures um, until Virginia expanded Medicaid in 2017, like thousands of people literally died from not having health care. So the work that's being done by volunteers here at Sister District is life-saving work. Um, it's really, really important work. So thank you all so much for what you're doing. Great, thank you so much, Gowry and Brooke and Alex. I think what you'll find is a lot of uh, candidates or a lot of staff who are working at the state ledge level are activists in their community uh, way beyond the scope of their professional roles on campaigns. And I think this group definitely is representative of that. Uh, so, so happy to have everyone here. Now let's get into our questions. Our first question is actually back to Alex. Um, and today I'd love to hear about the phases of your campaign from a voter contact standpoint. So sort of the life cycle of your operation um, and especially where volunteers are plugging in along the way. Sure thing. Um, Pennsylvania has a closed primary, uh, which means that only the Republicans and the Democrats come out. So before the primary, we focused with phone banks and lit drops on the Democrats that were likely to vote uh, in person and the Republicans all across the board. 
uh, just basically we knew if we had a robust message and we got in there early and consistently uh, that it would in the end drown out any of the negative stuff that the Republicans were going to run later on. Uh, so the lit drops went almost to the whole universe and we timed that out so that the candidate could do those. Uh, there wasn't a lot of door knocking at the time with COVID. If she happened to run into somebody, she was able to engage them in a conversation. Uh, we weren't encouraging the volunteers at all, uh, really to do the lit drops or the door knocking just to stay safe out here. Um, when we got into the general, we focused right away on the independents that felt missed out in the primary. And then we divvied up the phone banks. Um, Sister District helped us mostly with independents with the postcards to voters and the phone banking weekly. We had Turn PA Blue and PA Stands Up, mainly calling the Democrats. Uh, the different Democratic committees here focused on their local voters. And then the candidate and I focused on follow-ups, reaching out, uh, specific questions that we would get during the phone banks that the volunteers were able to pass on uh, so that the voters could feel in touch with her without the, um, the door knocking, because she really loved door knocking. She had run uh, for mayor in the past and council in the past, and that had always been a big part of the campaign was connecting with voters, which we, um, we just all lost with, with COVID, really, the door knocking. Um, so we had a 12-piece mail program, which was supplemented by independent programs, ran about 20 pieces on top of that. And then we tried to stay uh, positive, non-comparative pieces in the program and just focused on Nancy Guest and why she was the best candidate. And then mm, get out the vote the last two weeks, we basically doubled all of our targets for phone calls, texting, lit drops. And we were able to coordinate with the Biden campaign in the area uh, to get as, as much reach as, as we could. And volunteers through and through the entire time were one of the most important parts of the campaign. We could not have done any of it without you guys. Great. Well, you definitely had every uh, mode and method employed at every phase of the campaign um, and definitely paid off. So my next question is going to be for Gowry. Um, in your race, what do you think was the most effective method of voter contact? And this is just for your race. So we're talking phones, uh, postcarding, texts, et cetera. So by far, um, phones and when we were able to knock, definitely knocking, right? So I think a lot of the reason why campaign staffers are so big on these like conversations is, you know, we are trying to collect data to bring in to our campaign so that we can make strategic decisions. Um, and ultimately, the thing about postcards is that they're great at informing, you know, voters that an election is happening and giving them a little bit of you know, voter information, but what these conversations do is that they engage in a dialogue and that's where a lot of the persuasion in these really tough districts ends up happening, right? It's like, what are the issues that you care about? Okay, um, you know, do, are, are you going to end up supporting our candidate or voting for our candidate, right? And like being able to put that data in the system so that we can make decisions and mobilize the people that we've identified as supporters is just really key. Um, we had Sister District kind of run our entire ballot chase program, um, and that was literally entirely based on phone bank data of like folks that we had identified as Brittany supporters. So that way we could make sure that when Sister District was ballot chasing, they were chasing folks that we knew were like strong Democrats, registered Democrats, or even like random Republicans who said they were voting for Brittany, right, making sure that their ballot got submitted. Great. Well, you definitely put us to work and we appreciate it. So my next question is going to be for Brooke. I would love to hear about your process for selecting and writing uh, voter contact script materials. So what we're using when we're talking on the phones, what we're using in postcards and things like that. I wanna say first that, you know, COVID really disrupted and you pended a lot of the traditional norms of direct voter contact. Um, and consequentially, there were a lot of different forms of messaging that we traditionally would use, particularly at the door that weren't as upfront um, as a lot of our messaging here uh, on the phones and on postcards. Um, with phones and postcards, you're ex more limited with the time that you have to uh, you know, curate and foster a dialogue between the campaign and 
uh, between our voters. So that was one of the things we were very mindful of when selecting our messaging. Uh, one of the other things I want to note, um, since Georgia is finally on the map and probably will be at least for the next two years, um, we built a lot of our messaging off of the infrastructure that was built by Stacey Abrams. Um, we were lucky to have those resources that weren't previously available for a lot of the state legislature or state legislative campaigns here in Georgia. Um, our infrastructure has notoriously been weak um, and we haven't had a lot of national support um, prior to um, Stacey's run for governor in uh, 2018. So a lot of our resources and our data were built off of what was successful with the Abrams campaign. And primarily when reaching a lot of people by phone, um, the main portion of the conversation, since you have such a short time, was to ensure you had name ID um, and that you uh, could figure out whether or not they plan to support you based off of name ID and party affiliation alone. So a lot of our messaging was really bold up front, which I know was a bit of a struggle, particularly for our volunteers who weren't directly involved with the campaign because it's so weird to talk to a complete stranger and ask them, are you voting for this person right away rather than really generating a, a great organic conversation. So a lot of our messaging on the phones was built off of previous success for campaigns, um, but also um, ensuring that we got what we needed right out the gate. Um, and then if they were willing to talk more then we could change the conversation to something more organic and discuss what's important to them uh, if they wanted to speak on the phone and or what we could do to gain their votes. Um, but the most important thing we needed to know right off the bat um, for any portion of our program was who was supporting Shay um, and uh, if they could do it just off of name ID alone. So that was our main portion of our conversation. Now for our um, postcards and a lot of our texting as well, one of the things we were looking to do is um, gather data. Um, so uh, any way that we could get data from uh, these conversations was driving our script for um, that limited space that you had. So a lot of our postcards, we actually had QR codes attached to or just a you know, short bitly so that if they were willing to engage with the campaign, we could at least get an email or a phone number that we could use for later. So we had very small script, punch you kind of quick uh, name ID and uh, get the message across on a larger format, such as a web page where we could really discuss what's important to them and or uh, gain important information for contact in future uh, instances. So, yeah. Great. Uh, well, my next question is back to Gary, and I actually think you touched on this a little bit in your uh, other response, but I have a question about how you use, make decisions and how uh, volunteer generated uh, band data can uh, go into decision making and what it kind of looks like behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the thing about you know, the thing about <laughs> phone banking, door knocking, any form of voter contact is that, you know, you are doing like the human work of relating to people and people relate to people and not just scripts. So that's like really important. But also you guys are all collecting data for us. And I always like joke, like whenever I go and knock on doors, um, sometimes I volunteer on campaigns just to like stay sharp. Um, and I just always joke that I am like a glorified data collector, but that human work of data collection is still really important. Um, and a lot of what I have done um, in as a manager with the data collected, like I've mentioned earlier, um, I, I've basically been able to pull all of the ones. So ones meaning strong supporters, strong ID supporters to build out something called a mobilization universe. So in, um, in any form of campaigning, there's going to be a field program where you have to decide these universes of voters that you are reaching. Um, so a mobilization universe is typically folks that we know are strong, reliable Democratic voters or like super Dems or people that have, you know, been triple primary Democratic voters that have voted in three out of the four primaries in the last, you know, four years. Um, but that combined with like these ID supporters that um, you all as volunteers have identified, right? So that whole cohort of people is in something called a mobilization universe. And those are the voters that we are... <laughs> true to the name, trying to mobilize and turn out to vote, helping them make their vote plans. So 
that data is really critical, um, you know, in the current campaign that, you know, we're trying to, you know, make sure that we get across the finish line through November, right? But in addition to that, in the future, a lot of these like voter IDs that you put together are also sort of used to kind of strengthen our voter file and understanding of the electorate. Because a lot of the, you know, we talk about organizing work as though it's like this glorified like community thing, which it absolutely is. But so much of it is also just like building an understanding of what the electorate is um, and what they're thinking. So um, a really good example of this, right, is like a lot of the data that's been collected since the 2016 election has shown that like, you know, white women in particular have been skewing more and more democratic, especially white women in the suburbs. And that's because of data that's been collected by campaigns over the years that's built into the voter file. And, you know, we're starting to get a deeper understanding of how those voters think just by virtue of the survey responses that y'all are collecting. So, um, you know, any good campaign um, is trying to, you know, build an organizing structure, not only to win an election, but also to build infrastructure to win in the longer term, right? And like building out that, you know, um, building out the the organizing culture needed to win um, beyond just this November. Great, thank you so much, Gary. Um, for the moment, we're actually going to switch gears and now talk about uh, fundraising and budgeting, but I know that we have some questions about voter contact and field and hopefully we'll be able to circle back at the end and answer some of those. So my first question is back to Brooke. I would love to hear about what grassroots fundraising support meant for your race and what you were able to do or not do. So uh, honestly, given the uh, limitations with the pandemic um, and given being in a state race, grassroots run fundraising was by large and far the most important aspect of our race. And I can say that uh, particularly uh, considering that I was able to run Shay's race uh, for two cycles. We had the same exact candidate, the same exact values, and more or less the same exact target audience. Um, but we did not win in 2018. We came close, but we did not, were unable to flip that uh, seat. Uh, and a lot of that was due to the limit and resources we had at that time. Um, we raised about $75,000 in um, 2018. And in 2020, we re raised uh, around 330,000. So there's a complete difference in our capacity to reach um, our voters. So for us, knowing that you know we were limited with being able to use what I would say is free resources, but our volunteers at the door, uh, again, using that golden standard that Gary reached on with uh, dialogue, the two-way conversation that we so heavily rely on to uh, not only gather data, but to really get to know our voters. Um, we didn't have that except for our phone calls and our phone calls were only as good as the data we had in our, our voter universe. And our dat database here in Georgia is pretty weak. I can't speak on the other states, but there were a lot of phone calls that were wrong numbers or disconnected almost all the time. So, um, you know, we didn't have that that door to door and that meant that we had to rely on more expensive resources like texting software. Um, and so without being able to use those as I know many other uh, legislative candidates were limited um, this go round, we were able to do so much more because of our fundraising. We were able to hire a larger team, particularly at the end when we still needed to reach our phone call goals that we were not making originally. We were able to get on TV, which we could not do the first time. And most importantly, we were able to run um, our mail program. And those mail programs, despite how annoying I know they feel when you're getting uh, mail, I'm still getting mail in February for our January 6th race we had here. Um, so I know they're frustrating, but they are the one way, particularly when you can't reach people door to door, it's the one way to guarantee that mail is getting to voters or your, your campaign is getting to voters. Um, so we were able to run a very aggressive 16 piece campaign uh, because we had the, the means to do so. And that's well over $100,000 of investment. Uh, that we needed to put towards just our mail program alone. So I can say with beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were able to win solely because we had the capacity to, and that was due to the grassroots fundraising that was completed not only 
through what our campaign did, but through what Sister District did for us, um, which raised actually a fairly large portion beyond what we ever imagined we would get um, with our support with uh, Sister District I and mean, then everything. Great, thank you, Brooke. And back to Alex on a little bit the same note, if you could talk to um, donors and people who are, a lot of our folks here in this room are uh, going out and fundraising in their communities and they are trying to make ask themselves of why these races are important and why we need to give and why we need to keep, keep giving until election day. Um, so what would be your response about um, last minute donations and why they are still so crucial in state legislative elections? Sure, absolutely. Um, when we got near the end of it and we had a little bit of excess in the budget, uh, what we looked at was if we wake up on election day and we lost this race, what did we not do? Uh, where did we not go? Uh, so what we did last minute was we invested in paid phone banking and targeted people that were not on the regular phone banks. Uh, we were looking at strong Republican voters, uh, independents that had hung up on phone bankers before and basically said, we're gonna take that out of the hands of the volunteers and we're gonna give that to a group of people that are being basically paid to do it. Um, and a lot of people them got yelled at or hung up on, but in between all that, we were still able to reach voters who were like, okay, tell me about the issue. Okay, talk to me, do this. And it was a good, good last push. Um, what we also did was supplemented the literature. We added a bunch of uh, lit dropping at the end, uh, cause we had just a rush of volunteers come in near the end and we were able to give them things to do other than the phone banking or the text banking. Just, okay, here's a pile, here's a street list, go out and, and, and if you wanna knock, knock, if you're comfortable with it. If not, drop the lit and go and just let us know where you got. And then near the end, uh, our candidate wanted to know if it was possible if we could donate to some of the other races. Uh, so what we did was we identified where the grassroots fundraising, where she had been listed as a slate of other flips. And we picked out three different candidates that were also flips that were asking for money at the end. And we were able to just drop off a, a couple of small dollar checks and just help them out with last minute uh, ad placement, last minute digital buys, whatever they needed to do. Because anything that helps across the state helps everybody in the end. Wow, thank you. That's incredible leadership there. I didn't even know that story, uh, but great to hear. And so my last question here is about digital ads and I'll go ahead and integrate a question from uh, the audience here. And this is for uh, Brooke. I'd love to hear about digital ads. I know you're an expert here, um, what they meant for your race um, and how you use social media in general to reach voters in a very unprecedented time. Yeah, that was, um an interesting form that we had to, you know, take hold of, but also note its limitations. So I want to say first and foremost that it was our final layer of communications and what I would consider always as icing on the cake, particularly with the product that we have, which is uh, politics and a person. Um, we're not buying a really cute piece of clothing. Um, we're not, you know, selling something that you could use uh, in your house. Um, it's a product that is really hard to push out to your market uh, and that people do not want to see. So uh, that's something to keep in mind when you consider what you think your capacity with um, digital ads can be working in this political space. Um, of course, as I've mentioned before, of utmost importance was our mail program and it continues to be um, the most effective way to ensure that you're reaching your large swath of your universe uh, in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and then we look at our phone calls, of course, as I mentioned before, the dialogue, that's super important, uh, text, emails, postcards, TV, uh, and then finally getting over to digital advertising. There are two important things to keep in mind with digital advertising. One is that folks often have ad blocking software and or are considered ad blind uh, on the computer. Um, we've been looking at these native ads and display banner ads for so long, people don't even look at them on the side of their computer. And so you want to keep those things in mind when you're thinking about how effective uh, digital advertising could be and how much money to put towards it. 
And the other thing you want to consider is that you're limited in a uh, space to a small portion of someone's screen. So, you know, if you have a block that's actually only this big, as opposed to a huge mail piece, or as opposed to, you know, a minute and a half conversation, you have to get everything to fit in something this small. So you have to keep in mind what's most important to you and what, what message you want to prioritize. So for static ads, so those ads that don't have videos or any kind of movement to it, the primary strategy for us was strictly name ID and the voting date. The more that you see Shea Roberts on your screen over and over again, hopefully by the eighth time, you'll remember it. And when you get to the ballot, you'll see Shea Roberts and be like, oh, I might not have seen anything that she put out. I didn't go to her campaign. I never received mail never got reached by phone call, but that's the only one I saw in this race. I see her name, I'll vote for her. That's really important for these state legislative races and anything smaller than a state ledge, municipal races. All we're fighting for first and foremost is name ID because we do not have leverage of uh, the bandwaves or airwaves. You know, we can't get on TV very often. We don't have a lot of earned media. They're just not sexy races that people want to write about. So you're really reliant on first and foremost, your name ID for a lot of your voter uh, universe. So that's what we did for our static ads. Uh, for all dynamic ads, such as videos, you honestly rarely have longer than five seconds to get your message across. So again, the candidate's name has to be on the screen early and prominently um, because it needs to be the main takeaway. So those are the two things you want to keep in mind when you're considering how to target and what to put on your message. Um, but really one of the greatest aspects of digital advertising that's not spoken about enough um, because we continue to push other forms of digital con or other forms of contact is that with digital advertising, you can adjust your budget really quickly, whether you're adjusting because ads aren't doing really well or you were short on money or you have a lot more fundraising than you anticipated. This is the one form of communications that you can adjust and respond quickly. Uh, mail programs are usually fixed. Even if you wanna put something else in, it takes weeks with your, you know, your mail firm to get the right design, the right voter contact, and then schedule at the right time for USPS to get it out the door. With TV, you gotta buy your TV spot. Those are all fixed. This is the one place where you can change things up in a heartbeat. So that sliding scale allows a lot of different campaigns to adjust and reach a large amount of people. So it's one of those things that it can be one of the final pieces of your communication uh, for campaigns with a larger budget, but for campaigns who are really limited and can't even do a mail piece, which is understandable, it's one of the strongest, most effective forms of uh, allotting your budget for voter contact. So it's one of those things for us, small piece, but originally in our 2018 campaign, when we had nothing, it was one of our largest forms of advertising. Great, and just a quick follow-up question from the chat. Um, do you think that mail programs are the most important element in any election or just in a COVID setting? Um, I think there's a lot to debate about this. And I really hope one day that mail will not be because it's a really antiquated form of contact that we continue to rely on specifically in this space. You do not see a lot of other uh, industries having to rely on mail to have a successful um, campaign for whatever product they're using. But here it continues to dominate regardless of what level you're at. So whether it's you know a, a federal race, because federal races really actually rely a lot on forums that aren't direct voter contact, such as media, um, and being on the radio or anything like that. They don't really do a lot of like phone calls unless that's just like a tiny little form of um, uh, ROI for them. So I think at this point, mail will always be a gold standard until our industry can figure out something better. Well, you heard it here. <laughs> Um, okay, so switching gears back to volunteers and volunteer capacity for a moment before we get to our questions and answers. Um, I have a question for Alex. If you could talk about what the impact volunteers had on your race, what that allowed you to do day to day, knowing that that support was there consistently. Sure. Um, we've talked a lot about phone banking, um, but I'd love to talk about the impact that Sister District had on our fundraising. 
uh, the last cycle, uh, the same candidate was um, only raised twenty thousand dollars. The candidate before that, two years before that, only raised six thousand dollars. Now, sister district, with your guys' help, between in kind and and monetary donations, we raised almost five hundred thousand dollars. And we wouldn't have been able to do a robust mail program. We wouldn't able to do the phone banking and the lick drops and everything that we needed to do with COVID without your guys' help. And that was that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Great. I'm sure we all want to echo that. I mean, the fundraising capacity completely changed the game for all of our all of our campaigns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. Um, I don't think that any race in South Central, any state state house race, at least on the Democratic side, had ever made it on TV in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, but thanks to the support of Sister District, we were able to purchase, I mean, thousands of points on TV to get Brittany's name, name ID up to get to bring her very close to getting across the finish line. But, you know, alas, our opponent ended up getting nearly 22,000 votes um, in a really tough district. So like, obviously there, there, there's so much that, there's only so much that even the most effective campaign can do. Um, but I do think that ultimately like, you know, Brittany was well known in the community by the end, by the time that she was knocking on doors, like people were like, oh my God, I've seen you on TV. That would not have been possible if not for the financial contributions um, from sister districts members, from just grassroots donors around the country, um, especially because we weren't taking any corporate PAC money, right? So that's where that, um, where these grassroots donations really went a long way. Um, I also just wanted to share another perspective about mail really quickly, because um, actually it's been, sh studies have shown that one of the most effective ways of reaching young voters is through robust mail, because um, I am 24 years old. So like I get a million digital ads about God knows what, but if I get a, you know, a um, piece of mail that's addressed to me, it's like, oh, cool, I'll take a look at that. That's actually, um, there's some studies that have shown that like mail is a really effective way of reaching um, young voters. And actually, if you know, if you heard of Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from Washington State, she actually ended up winning her congressional primary literally because she had such a robust mail program that was targeting younger voters in her district. So um, I don't wanna completely discount the importance of it. I think that um, it is a really useful tool for upping name recognition. It's also one of the most targeted way of reaching voters. The thing about TV is that everybody watches TV. There's just like no way to really target it in the same way because you're just advertising to everybody. Whereas with a mail program, you get to, it's one of the most efficient ways to reach voters because you're literally targeting who your recipients are. Absolutely. Well, Gary, uh, my last question of the day uh, that I have prepared before we get into question and answers for you, I want to hear about your message to our volunteers that we have here, um, what it means to have help from volunteers, and if they are going to volunteer uh, for their next state legislative race, how they can be the most helpful um, to their candidate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that there are a lot of people um, I've had some experiences where folks are like, I want to help with strategy. And I'm like, the most important strategy that we have with the campaign is talking to voters. That is just like the most important labor that anyone can do. Like, like I said, like I still volunteer on campaigns in my spare time just to like stay sharp and like understand what it's like to actually speak to voters. Um, because I think it's very easy to kind of get stuck in that ivory tower of like, I'm managing this campaign and this enormous budget, but also like, talking to voters has like actually enabled me to really like think through like what are the voters actually thinking about so that's where you as volunteers have such a unique role and like an ear on the ground right to actually hear um to actually hear what voters are thinking and like share that with like folks that are in management share that with the candidate right um because you are actually doing like that human work of like relating to voters and um getting a sense of what's important to them um, so I think, you know, that's just the most critical and the most important way that volunteers can be helpful. Also sort of on a, um, on a related note, I just also want to note that like, it's also just really important that volunteers like be kind to campaign staffers. Like a lot of us have, are doing, are underpaid and overworked for like the type of work that we are doing. And um, I've had a lot of situations with volunteers where um, I would not have been talked down to if I wasn't like a young woman and a young brown woman working in politics, um, there was actually like one particular situation where I just, 
you know, I just remember thinking like, why do I work in politics if volunteers treat me like this? You know, we're Democrats. We're fighting for a world that treats everybody with dignity and with respect. And that needs to also extend to how we treat one another when we're working on these campaigns. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there as well. It's just like m most of us who are campaign stoppers are just really doing our best. Um, and I just want all of you guys to know that. And yeah, definitely like voter contact, talking to voters, that's just like the most important work that you can be doing. Um, yeah. Well, I love that last note about being kind. I think it's, especially in an environment where everything's digital and everything's email and you don't necessarily meet face-to-face, -face, it's a, such a good reminder that you are working with folks, um, real people who are working really, really hard. Um, and we all definitely have the same goal at the end, especially uh, the group that we have here today. So thank you all for those questions, uh, those great answers. I know that you have been working overtime in the chat. I see that a lot of our panelists here have been working uh, to answer some of these questions. So thank you so much. You've gone above and beyond uh, what we called you here to do today. But I do want to go ahead and get through some of the questions that I uh, thought were really great uh, in this chat here. So my first question and maybe how we should do this is I'll give everyone a chance to kind of say their two cents, um, every one of our panelists for each of these questions, unless you don't have anything to say and then we can just skip. Um, how does that sound? Cool. So my first question is uh, a little bit about your background training, um, what it took to become a campaign manager, especially if we have folks who are looking to make a transition or grow into that role um, in the future, what kind of trainings were available to you, um, or perhaps some sort of preparation that wasn't available to you, but should have been. Um, I'll start off. Uh, so Nancy Gans and I had worked on campaigns before, uh, which was really good for laying the groundwork with a lot of the local democratic committees, which can sometimes work as gatekeepers to the uh, volunteers on their side. Uh, if there's not a mutual respect there, they're just going to do their own thing. Um, before getting into campaigns with Nancy, I came from uh, stage management and technical direction in the theater world. That's amazing. I'm going to touch base on Georgia not having a lot of training. <laughs> um, I don't know how I know in Oregon, just just sort of randomly naming a state, um, but they have a lot of uh, infrastructure within their caucus to provide a lot of resources for their candidates and a lot of training for staff who are interested. Prior to Stacey Abrams run, there was count on two hands uh, the amount of experienced staffers we had here in Georgia. And when I say experience, they were still fully self-taught. Um, so a lot of what was passed down was just, you know, clinical success uh, and not, you know, evidence-based kind of success. Um, and that proved to be uh, as ineffective as uh, possible because we weren't really making any change here. Um, but one thing that I found useful, and I actually really want to drop it in, in the uh, chat, which I'm doing right now, um, that I think anyone could really use. It's a relatively accessible resource if you have good uh, internet access, is uh, training that's available, whether you're interested in running for office or you're interested in supporting someone running for office through the DLCC. Um, and I encouraged all of our hired staff to go through these. Um, and then one of the things we did was provide training for all of our, um, especially our, our volunteers who were fully committed to the campaign. Um, so that they had tangible resources to pass on. So that's one of the missions we're doing here in Georgia is making sure we're expanding our pool of experienced staff, but also expanding our resources that we can pass on for anyone interested, um, you know, at any point in any stage running at any, uh, whether you're running for office or supporting someone running for office. Thank you. And we have one minute left. So I'll go ahead and throw Gowry a hybrid question. Um, what is training uh, that was made available to you in Pennsylvania? And how did you feel like the general party support was uh, for your race and how you navigated all of those relationships? For sure. Um, so I, like, <laughs> like Brooke and Alex, had to sort of crowdsource my knowledge on how I would end up managing a campaign. I actually didn't even know the campaign management was a path for me really until I actually went to a presentation hosted by 
um, a former senior staffer on the Warren campaign, which was a presidential campaign I worked on before I managed Britney's campaign. Um, her name is Emily Parcell. She was amazing. And she was like, if you've been a field organizer once, you were qualified enough to be a campaign manager for a state ledge race. Um, and that was just the motivation I needed to actually go into managing. Um, and I also just want to note that I was, I think, the only woman of color campaign manager in the general election cycle in Pennsylvania. So that was kind of wild um, in its own way. So um, as far as like party, you know, party support and infrastructure. So the, bi the big thing is that, um, you know, we, we were working a lot with the party to kind of figure out how they could help us fill in budget gaps. They have connections to stakeholders who could help us fill in budget gaps. So um, sometimes when it came time for like, okay, we have a $10,000 budget gap in order to do this next TV ad buy. What we needed to do was, you know, talk, communicate that with the caucus and um, especially because we were, I mean, we spent <laughs> um, over $400,000, if I remember correctly, on broadcast and cable TV buys. So that meant just having conversations um, and being in dialogue with them. I think the other thing is that sometimes we forget that, you know, the caucus can occasionally be kind of a kingmaker when they're um, allocating resources across the state. Um, and this is something where, you know, I was working with Brittany, who was like a really young candidate. She, I mean, she's an amazing candidate. And like I said, like we're also personally friends now. And um, one of the things that I definitely think about, that she and I have definitely talked about this, was at first she had a really hard time getting like the party and the caucus to take her seriously until she started raising a lot of money. Like, I mean, she was calling her friends for public sector employees making $40,000 a year for like $25, $50 donations. And then with the help of sister district um, was able to prove that she was a viable candidate so that the caucus actually would start paying attention to paying attention to her and like begin investing in her. And this was before I was hired, but that was something that she had sort of alluded to me. So I think, you know, the party and the caucus plays a really important role in like amplifying candidates um, and sort of making them, you know, more viable. Um, and I, I see that there's a question in the chat about women candidates. Um, yeah, women candidates are generally very underinvested in. So um, that's where, you know, Represent PA was also a really helpful, you know, donor and just a really helpful amplifier for Brittany. Great. Well, we are so happy to be a part of your race and everybody's races, um, especially the folks who are represented here on our panel today. So thank you, Gallery. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Alex. Um, I know we could talk all day long um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to connect again. We are almost at our break time, um, so definitely want to make sure we save time for that. Uh, but just want to say thank you again. I know uh, all of our three panelists today are part of our sister district alumni community on the campaign staff side. So we'll definitely be in touch. Um, and if you need to reach any of them, you can send me an email. Um, that's Kira at sisterdistrict.com. Um, and I will uh, try to facilitate any questions that you have remaining. Um, so thank you all. I know some of you are already involved in your next uh, state ledge races, especially Gallery here in Virginia. So thank you for that service. Um, and we can't wait to see you again.